So, hello, and uh, thank you very much for joining us here. Very welcome to a, what I hope will be a very interesting seminar about preservation of digi digital objects. Uh, this seminar is organized in connection to a project, a large uh, research project called Pericles, which is funded by EU. And we have uh, quite a very, uh, a lot of interesting people here uh, who are interested in related issues uh, related to digital preservation. But uh, before we start, can I just ask you, how many of you know what this is? <laughs> yes? So a second question, how many of you today have got some electronic device which you like an iPad or a laptop or a smartphone or something similar? So almost everyone. So consider, considering the devices that you have with you today or the devices that you use every day at work or at home, how many of you will be able to tell me what's on this? Not many. So when I talk to my colleagues within the project, they often talk about three different changes. One of them is change in technology. So that's why this has become almost obsolete. Then they also talk about change in culture and values and practices. And a third change would be the change in language, uh, the way we use language, meaning, and semantics. And Pericles deals at least with two of these three changes. So we can um, uh, start and uh, talk about who the Anna uh, are. And today um, we have Christine Salter, who is the project manager of Pericles, and she is from King's College London. Then we have Sanya Halli, who is from Digisum, which is an organization that, um, uh, which is at the National Archives and is responsible for the Swedish National Coordination of Digitization. She is very interested in digital <coughs> preservation and um, uh, culture, digital cultural heritage and preservation of that, and she's been involved in many different projects, both national and international. Then um, we have my colleague um, Stratus Kontopoulos, who is from uh, CERT ITI, which is a large uh, uh, research institute in Greece and he is a member of uh, Pericles and a senior, uh, senior researcher. Then we have Joran Christiansson, who is archival director at the Regional Archives in Lund, which is a department of the National Archives of Sweden. And he has previously had the research and development of the National Archives. He has been project manager for development of different systems and databases. And he too has been involved in many different projects and interested in preservation of digital objects. Then we have a colleague from uh, the Royal Library, uh, Ben Nace, and he is an IT architect and operation manager at the National Library. And uh, he has worked with archiving and standardization and interested in long-term preservation of digital content and uh, has also been involved in development of systems and whatever and um, different projects as well. And finally, we have a colleague from the Gothenburg University, Marika, Maria Kavalin Eimer, who is, um, um, whose PhD is in history and works at the Department of History, but um, uh, histor historical studies. And she is, um, uh, has special re responsibility for the education of archival science. So, very interesting panel, everyone interested in digital preservation. And like I said, this is organized in connection to Pericles, so we might as well go to the project manager and ask her to tell us a little bit what Pericles is about. Christine. Thank you, Nathalie. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I think, uh, as we see from the reaction, you don't need to be a digital expert, a digital preservation expert, to know that digital files and, and, and data nowadays are very fragile. Um, in the last two and a half decades, the research on preservation has increased exponentially. Um, so I think the question um, 
the question, the big questions that are asked uh, for preservation, which are about access and reuse, is how can we um, enhance discovery, which is a big research field, how can we support management, uh, or how can we counteract the uh, rapid, the, the speed at which um, technology becomes obsolescent. Uh, obsolescent. Uh, Heracles situates itself in the management field. How do we support management? If I may say very simply, in a very simplified way, a curator was a lot about uh, what the main decision-making process of a curator was um, keep it or delete it. And if you keep it, for how long do you keep it, how do you keep it, how much effort do you put into it, and so on. Now there is a new aspect that comes into this decision-making process, and that's the question of change. How to react to change, or how to proactively move within a changing environment. Um, the thing about uh, digital environments is that they are so complex that they have an intricate network of dependencies that need a lot of different types of knowledge to understand exactly where these dependencies lie, not only within the digital environment, but also between that environment and the humans that operate it. Um, and this is very diverse, and in order to make an informed decision about the impact of change, or to understand the impact of change, you need to have this knowledge, which is not always available in an organization. Um, Pericles is therefore proposing to um, introduce a technological layer into your management system, in the widest sense, um, that would support this decision-making process, which would mean that you would need to translate, or that's our proposal, you translate this knowledge about the dependencies into a model, and Stratus is going to say more about the models, which will lead to a model-driven management and ultimately to model-driven preservation. Meaning you translate the reality, the, the dependencies of the current reality into a model, but then the tricky thing is you want actually to understand what happens if I change this reality. So you would simulate another reality in which, into which you have introduced the change, and then that's the, the real tricky bit is how do you make machines analyze the difference between those two. So the simulated reality which includes the change that you want to introduce or is being introduced externally, um, and your current situation. And this is what Parities has focused on, trying to find ways to have something like a dynamic model implemented uh, into your systems. Um, and we are working with two use case partners to showcase this layer because we are not proposing a final tool, we are actually tool or, or system, we are proposing an approach, if you like, um, in order to make this clear how this approach should be implemented by people who will in future provide, produce systems. We ourselves, of course, produce a test bed uh, together with the use case partners Tate and uh, USA, which is the user support operations center for the ISS. So we have two very different use case partners, one whose remit it is to actually preserve, and not only preserve complex objects, but really difficult objects that in artifacts be unique and original and have to remain that way. Whereas on the other hand, we have the space science people uh, or the operation center um, that deals with unique data in a very different kind of way, but has no remit to preserve in the way a museum or an archive is preserving it. Um, so although they know they have to keep this data, storage is the only thing we sort of think of, um, but therefore you're providing data that will never be repeatable. So it's very important to keep that data, but they have no real um, practices in place for preserving that data. So these are our two use case partners, and with them we showcase how such a layer, what it would look like, and we provide tools that are not yet available, that take on the role that you need to provide that kind of layer, but we are not saying you have to use that tool. We know that in, in the future, better tools will be available that take on the role that we need to provide that layer into. But this is a research project, so we hope to initiate um, and convince people of actually going further with that in terms of development. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
When we talk about preservation of digital objects, we often talk, we hear people talk about linked data, and I wonder, Sonia, can you please tell us a little bit what linked data is and, uh, from the preservation point of view? Thank you. Um, well, linked data is actually a new technology which is used for making data more available and more useful. And uh, what does actually mean linked data or linked open data, which we often talk about? Um, from the preservation uh, point of view, um, there are different ways today to make data available and useful and to preserve it. And preservation of the digital information actually means that we uh, can, in the few, the, the future users can open information, understand it, and also understand the context that it was made in. So, how do we do it with linked data and what is linked data? Uh, well, linked data is actually linkable data, which means uh, digital information in machine-readable formats. And uh, to make it open, it is also licensed in a way that is machine-readable, and which means that it's freely uh, open to freely be used by anybody and reused. Um, so this um, technology actually gives a completely new way of use of digital information from the cultural heritage institution, for example, because uh, now the users are not only researchers and people looking for the information, but also uh, developers which want to make new products or new applications and services and tools uh, with this information. And uh, well, while interlinking those different data objects and data sets, we actually create link open data now. So uh, this is also um, this is a great opportunity, but also a great challenge from the digital preservation point of view, because uh, there's actually no central uh, um, administration of those different formats and different ontologies and uh, for, for those in between <coughs> data sets. So um, it is interesting to see what methods are used today and what methods will be used in the future to preserve even these interlinked data. Uh, what people use today is often that uh, those interlinked data sets are preserved as the linkable data with the links that are pointing on different other data sets. And they are preserved as databases or web documents or annotation web documents, uh, so in different ways. And um, it is um, interesting how to manage all these uh, data sets in the future because it is not possible that everybody make their own data clouds with those interlinked informations. Uh, uh, just to be sure that it is preserved for the future as it is in the moment when you were looking at it. And um, it's also very connected to the question of persistence and persistence identifiers, uh, which are actually code strings which you use to uh, publish a data object online often. Uh, and uh, how ontologies also are managed uh, to make those uh, linkable formats uh, for the future. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, but um, I think when uh, we hear about linked data, it uh, reminds us quite a lot about what you have been doing, Stratos in Pericles, related to ontologies. Can you tell us what is the relationship between the two? Related to, to, to each other? Sure. Uh, so, linked data and its ontologies. Uh, I don't know how many of, uh, of you are familiarized with these uh, two terms. They are sibling technologies. Uh, we are referring to cutting edge, state of the art technologies for knowledge representation. Um, you might have heard them in the context of what we usually call the semantic web or web 3.0. Uh, so, in Pericles, uh, we follow an approach that is quite related to linked data. We use, uh, we heavily rely on ontologies. Uh, ontologies are a, a knowledge representation uh, form, formula, model for representing domains of interest. 
Uh, so within uh, Pericles, we have um, various levels of uh, ontology models. We have a higher level uh, of uh, more abstract uh, ontology, which, which is called the linked resource model, the LRM. This is developed by another partner uh, within the project, Xerox. And uh, this is a very abstract upper level ontology for uh, representing and uh, modeling the dependencies between digital resources. Then uh, comes the middle layer ontology, which is called the digital ecosystem model. It relies uh, on the LRM, but extends it uh, with uh, various notions for representing uh, digital ecosystems, infrastructures, services, and uh, other related constructs. And then uh, comes our part, uh, which is the domain ontologies that have to do with representing the various uh, specifics within the two domains of interest. As Christine said, uh, in Berkeley we are uh, working on two domains, the space science and the art and media domains. Uh, so we are naturally developing two uh, ontology models for these two domains. Um, the aim of these two ontologies uh, is not to really to exhaustively model the domains and uh, all the related uh, properties and uh, interrelationships. Uh, we are mostly focusing on uh, uh, trying to model the digital preservation related risks in these domains. And this is actually done for the first time. Um, so we are trying to, uh, uh, trying to represent the impacts of, uh, of the various uh, changes that happen in these domains. And uh, we uh, also enrich the authorities with uh, computational models for um, computing the, the impact and the risk uh, for its change. Uh, the representations within the ontologies uh, are not only uh, representing, they don't really have to do only with representing the content, so we don't really represent only the resources and their metadata, who created the resource, etc. We also uh, enrich the, the, the ontologies with representing context. So whatever surrounds the, the resources, uh, is also within the ontology. Uh, which actors are involved with this resource? What activities is this resource uh, playing a role in, etc.? So, whatever has to do with the context, the environment, or the context of use of the resource, every, all this information is stored within the model. Um, within the project, we have uh, developed these ontologies uh, collaboratively with the domain uh, experts, uh, with Tate and uh, Buso. However, uh, the project also aims, uh, is aimed at uh, developing a methodology for uh, equipping, let's say, uh, future, uh, future customers or knowledge organizations in order to uh, enrich and develop their own models themselves. Finally, I would like to add that uh, all this uh, approach with the ontologies uh, serves uh, what we call the model-driven preservation approach. Uh, so, in essence, uh, we try to be proactive, we create a model of the ecosystem and we try to simulate changes uh, in the ecosystem before actually uh, performing these changes. So, this way we can uh, introduce a change into the model, we can see what impact this change is going to have to the resources or to all other uh, interconnected uh, constructs and resources. And if the uh, impact is not uh, it does not lead to something dangerous for the object itself, so that we don't lose the object and the accessibility to it in the future, then we can accept the, 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 the change that we introduced. Otherwise, we can reject it. Uh, so this is uh, paramount for our approach. Uh, we uh, introduce this novel model-driven uh, methodology, which uh, uh, tries to handle digital preservation in a proactive way and not a uh, reactive uh, contrary to other uh, relevant projects. Yeah, thank you. So then we have um, uh, two colleagues, both from the <coughs> National Library and National Archives, and obviously you both work with preservation of digital objects, but there must be some similarities and differences between you. So maybe each one of you could take uh, some time and tell us a little bit what you see as the important issues at your own organizations and compare them. So maybe we can start with you, Jorah. Yes. <clears throat> I'm, come, I'm from the National Archives of Sweden, and, and the, in the National Archives, standards are very important to use when it comes to long-term preservation. And it's not just standards in Sweden, it's an international cooperation between national archives worldwide in um, trying to 
be able to find a standard that could be reliable over time. And if we have to change standards in the future, we will do that simultaneously. And in Sweden, the National Archives have the advantage compared to the Royal Library that we can, accordance, in accordance to the Archival Act, uh, regulate what kind of standards the authorities in Sweden should use. So, for instance, if we have file formats that should be used, or description standards for descriptions, we can regulate that and say that the authorities should be using them before transferring the information to the Swedish National Archives. And it's also important to understand that we don't preserve the application. We only preserve the data and the documentation. So, for instance, if you have the Forsakingskast, uh, who de deals with social insurance issues, and they use a record management system, when they have decided what decision should be taken, it's the decision that we preserve, the document saying what uh, the decision said. And uh, we will not uh, preserve the software. But we will preserve the documentation of the process to take for taking that decision. And so we can, be, can understand uh, how the decision was taken. And this is also to understand that we use the migration strategy today, but we are very uh, interested in the emulation strategy that also Bengt will talk about. But so far, we think that the migration strategy is the most uh, uh, safe at the moment. The five formats we will regulate so far is, for instance, for is TIFF format for images, is PDF A for uh, documents. We don't preserve word perfect documents or word documents. We use XML for emails and databases. And for archive descriptions, there is an international standard called International Standard for Archive Description and the International Standard for Archive Authority records that we use, use worldwide. And we have national implementation of them. And if you have the possibility to go to the National Archives website and, and look in the National Archive database, that, that database is based on those standards. And that makes it possible to exchange information worldwide and, and cross-search information across archives, libraries, and museums. Uh, and all that information that we keep and store is kept in an electronic archives uh, in accordance with the, the standard for trusted digital repositories. And that is to be able to store it in a safe way into the future, for the eternity. That's our main, main goal, to save this information for eternity. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to yeah, tell thank you. you. So, Bing, what maybe you can talk about from your perspective from the National Library? Uh, yes, uh, the situation at the National Library, or the Royal Library, <clears throat> is somewhat different compared to the National Archives. Uh, our collections are quite diverse. Uh, uh, we receive content based on legal deposit. There is a special uh, law for electronically published documents on the web. And uh, we get donations, we harvest the web, we have our own digitization. <clears throat> and that is, because of that, uh, we have uh, collections consisting of television, radio, computer games, uh, web pages, uh, different kind of uh, file formats, uh, like uh, word process formats, etc. And uh, <coughs> we, we cannot uh, say to the people, uh, to the organizations delivering the content that we want them in a specific format, uh, but the law uh, stipulates that we have to receive them in the form that they were published. Um, so it's quite different for us. Um, <clears throat> so when we are looking on, on how to preserve this content, we have to take both uh, the migration track as well as the emulation track uh, or strategy into consideration. 
Uh, and this also affects uh, what kind of metadata we store uh, of the objects. Uh, we have, uh, for migration, you usually store technical metadata about the file formats, uh, what version of them, uh, perhaps what, what software that created them and so forth. But for the emulation, uh, we also need a lot of information about uh, uh, the runtime environment for the software. Uh, and so Emulation is quite widely used within the computer gaming uh, society at the moment. And um, as, a, as an example from, uh, from our library, in the project some years ago we received uh, a computer from a Swedish writer and uh, we extracted the content from that computer and uh, we have Word files Microsoft Word files created in the 1990s. And uh, if we try to open them in Microsoft uh, Word today, it doesn't recognize them. And so it says, well, there is a file format. Um, we can extract the data. So I get the text. Uh, the Swedish special characters are gone. Uh, the layout is gone. The typefaces and the fonts are gone. Uh, but I can read what it says. And, to be able to uh, uh, render that, that kind of document, we probably need to create an emulation environment with the software, with the software and printer drivers that was used at the time to, to see it properly. Uh, so emulation is uh, a real issue for us. And um, these are the kind of strategies that we use to, to try to uh, Make uh, a future generations experience the, the games and, and documents that we create in our time. Um, thank you for that. I have some follow-up questions that we can discuss in a little bit. But um, I also thought uh, I talked to you, Maria, and uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, insight from the educational. Uh, point of view. Obviously, you are not working with digital preservation yourself, but you are educating the people who probably will be working with digital preservation in the future. So, tell us a little bit what's happening there and potential challenges or the way you deal with digital preservation in your education. I will try. And I have to say that I'm mostly speaking for Gothenburg University and our education. And I I think I saw one of our earlier students, former students here, yes. <laughs> uh, and we are, as many of the education programs in archival science, uh, at the Faculty of Humanities, which makes a huge problem for us to find this, the knowledge to ensure the competence for teaching in digital preservation. And why is it so important? We, archival profession, the archive, archivist, it has changed so much from being someone working with paper, taking care of paper as the final stage of handling information. Now they are part of the process of handling information from the beginning to the end. So the whole profession has changed. Uh, and for me, it has really been a challenge to find the expertise uh, to find people who are prepared to teach and also to teach in a way that uh, functions, that communicates with the students. We have many times historians, archaeologists, not people used to work, to work with data sets and not knowing what the models mean. So it's really a challenge. Um, we, have, we have solved it, uh, working very hands-on, I would say. Uh, we have a person who works with digital, pre digital preservation as an archivist uh, and he really goes through the question of laws and regulations because the question is not just what, is, what do we need to preserve but how we follow the law. Uh, and this is a question of serving the citizens. Uh, the, digital the digital preservation is there to in the favor of the citizens. So it's so important that it's done in the right way. And many times our students, they might be working with a 
the important thing is that they know what they are talking about, that they understand <coughs> how to, which demands should be put on the people working with the data sets, with the preservation. So it's a question of giving concepts, giving uh, language of discussing what uh, the appraisal of information. So I think that's the most important for us. Um, the other thing, I'm a, a historian, as I said. For me, the question of digital preservation is important there too, I would say, because there are so, it's so easy to see now, all our students is writing about things, subjects being digitalized. They are not interested in the other things. So I see a danger there too, that there will be a, say, a bias, so we only study the things that are digitalized, which means that it's so important to have this kind of meetings where we can communicate, discuss, and open up the dialogue between uh, people from the data sector with the humanities. Um, well, I think what that was the most important about the, the education. It is a challenge, and the challenge is in every university in Sweden, uh, because we are mainly at the Faculty of Humanities. And the problem is how to keep up to date, how to know what is happening. Uh, and I think we can't learn all the things you do. We have to know what are our questions, what we need from you, and what is possible to do. So, if you think that uh, a lot of the things that come out of projects such as Pericles, they are quite technical, how do you see, uh, how can we deliver this to the people who need to work with digital preservation? I would say that some people are much more into it and they will find you. Uh, the question is how to discuss it, how to talk about it, I would say. And I think Christine did a tremendous job in making it understandable making it easy to start with. It was, so it's really a question of finding the meeting points. And uh, I think we had it from the National Archive, you had it good with the standards of everything. But on the other hand, my students are terrified, I have to say. <laughs> so it's a question of learning them that it's not dangerous. You need to do this. You don't have to be afraid of the technique. See it as a possibility. But on the other hand, you have to also be critical because we are sometimes too happy about it, so we forget other parts. The question of what used to be, what should we save, and what can we throw out? But today, everyone, everyone thinks everyone, everything is possible to preserve. But the question is, what do we need? What do, is, are we allowed to preserve for how long? And how can we find the information we need all the time? So, that is our challenges. <laughs> so I hear in uh, many of the discussions here. Uh, did you want to say something? Yeah, I would like to. Actually, you've, um, you've pointed out two very important topics that we have been discussing in parities with others. So the first, uh, we have coined a capability gap. This is one of the hot discussions at the moment. This divide between the professionals in the practical field and those who provide solutions for their problems that they don't have the knowledge to actually communicate properly with each other. That's one of the big issues. And the second big issue nowadays is researchers, and I admit, I think people always look at science more than at human uh, humanities as researchers, but they both provide results on the basis of data, and they do not um, think about uh, preserving their data, only the result, as you were pointing out. The result is being kept somehow, but the important thing is reusing, and reusing data would mean so much to other scientists if they wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, they could use the data already provided. And there is no, no awareness, not a, much, not a lot of awareness amongst researchers to do that. Um, and this is another hot topic that you addressed in more. <laughs> So I hear now we are getting to some of the challenges and they become more obvious, like for example, we want to reuse the information, but um, a lot of the data, like for example, the board document that 
you could now scrape the content, but not the actual document. That's the problem. So what is a document? Is it just the words, or is it the whole structure of it? So it becomes a, a problematic issue, plus that um, digital content is much more easy to manipulate. So it leads us to the question of trust. How can we trust the things that people have preserved? Is it really a representation of uh, the original thing? Like, for example, our partners, the Tate, uh, Tate galleries and things, they have uh, software-based art. And it's not just, so the whole room and all the in, uh, environment is part of the artwork. So how do we know in 100 years' time if that's the same art that that particular artist meant to produce? So we have a few minutes left. Maybe each one of you could take a turn and just quickly say your views about the trust issue or issues that you see as problematic. Shall we start with you, Christine? Actually, I would like to um, take stress on this because the way you introduced the with Tate, I think that's a big issue and that it's, uh, that's very typical with you as, a, as an example. The, the, the artwork you could not do what you were saying and just take the content. You have to emulate or whatever to do with it. And I think you had a lot of discussions um, about the famous significant properties as a way to deal with that. That's true. Um, regarding, for example, yeah, this was a good example with the document and its content. Uh, we had a specific use case, uh, one of these uh, uh, art and media use cases that have to do with uh, uh, more digital archives. Um, the data experts there told us that we don't really, we have a collection of poems, for example, uh, from um, uh, English uh, poets uh, some years ago, and they, they don't really want to preserve only the content, but also the form and the format of the poem, because the indentation uh, had uh, its own meaning. Uh, the uh, empty lines between uh, the verses had their own meaning, so they want to preserve this as well. Uh, this, shows that we don't really want to only digitize some things, but we also want to keep uh, some other information that is not uh, necessarily the content itself. Uh, these uh, things are usually called significant uh, information, um, and they have to do with uh, what the curators want uh, to preserve for, for its uh, resource. Um, we have, of course, uh, in the models we are uh, developing, we have also uh, considered that and we have a specific uh, representation for significant properties, how important they are, so there is a weighting mechanism, uh, what the impact of uh, their absence is, how, if, what's the problem if we don't preserve them, etc. etc. So uh, this is again something we have taken into consideration, we can discuss this uh, maybe afterwards. Uh, now moving to the uh, part about trust, uh, when someone hears about trust, uh, there are two things uh, they might uh, think about. One is, do I trust the source of this information? Um, which is not very relevant in our case. The second is, do I trust the results of a system? Uh, so here I have an automated system that tells me which things to preserve. Do I trust what it's telling me to preserve? Uh, my experience tells me that I should preserve something else, other problems, etc. Do I trust uh, derivations from the system? Do I trust uh, whatever this system presents. Very uh, and all the other animal projects are trying to come up with automated solutions uh, or semi-automated solutions. So we need to also uh, provide mechanisms for the people who are going to use these things uh, in order for them to trust the results. In our case, uh, we, the models I told, uh, talked about earlier are, are equipped with uh, explanation facilities, so whatever calculations or derivations or um, any uh, implicit information that is derived from the models, uh, all of this is explained through the explanation facility. There is a step-by-step -step, uh, explanation that uh, informs the user why this thing uh, has been derived and uh, uh, the person can uh, follow back uh, on the whole reasoning and understand whether this is valid or not. Anyone else has something to add? I can say that for the National Archives, of course, the trust is very important. And you, you have to rely on the sources. If it's proper police records or judge records and so on. So that's why we, it's important for us to, give, to be able to show the authenticity of the document, that the document 
is what it says it should be. And doing that is mostly an administrative uh, issue that you describe what have happened with the documents since it arrived to the National Archives. You can see all these stages when it migrated from one stage, one standard to, to the other and so on. And we have also checked some and so on, so we can see that it has, hasn't changed over time. Because if we can't trust the records, we don't know how good the source is, and then we don't know how reliable it is in, in, in the historical context. So it, this is very important. Um, and at the National Library, <coughs> of course, we work in a similar way. Uh, we try to implement uh, uh, different functions in our systems that will kind of log everything that happens to the object during, from the time we receive it until the day a user or a researcher somebody wants to see it. Uh, so they can see how, how, how have we, uh, what have we done with the document since we received it and what kind of process it has it gone through. And then they can kind of, I don't know how to say this in English, but uh, uh, they can, uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they can make an, 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 well, kind of an educated guess on, on uh, if the document if, is authentic or if it has changed in some way uh, during our process. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? No, Maria. Can I just say that I really agree with you here about the importance of authenticity and trust and how we're connected it. And I would say it's not just a question for the historical uh, side, so which is that it's a question for society, but the question of believing in the material that is left from the authorities, it is the question of stage legit legitimacy in the end, I would say. Uh, and I think that is really important. It sounds a bit pretentious, perhaps, but it is important because so much proves that if you don't believe in the records, in the documents, then there is a distrust towards the, the, the authorities. Yes, yes uh, I can also say that if we are looking at the future where you, all the information is interlinked in different ways and available in, at the internet, uh, it is really important to stress uh, the question of trust uh, because you would like to see everything at once, uh, the information from the cultural heritage institutions, from the research connected to that information, from different user communities that added information to, but you really need to know what information here is really reliable. And that is uh, the question for the cultural heritage institutions and preservation to work with. So in this little short time that we've had, we haven't even started scratching the surface of the important issues that is uh, digital preservation. But I hope we have started a little bit of conversation that we can continue in other forums. So a um, couple of the problems have come up, but there are many challenges that need to be solved and addressed. And we perhaps can keep in contact and uh, uh, follow up this conversation in another forum. And um, I just want to say that my colleague has uh, prepared some evaluation uh, paper about the seminar, but attached to that there is a slip with the address of Pericles if you are interested to learn a little bit more about the project, it's there. Then we are here in Sweden at Hexkola Niburos, so if you are uh, at all interested to know a little bit more or discuss things, please contact us so we will be here. Well, uh, I have a couple of minutes, so I tell you a couple of things about what we are doing in Pericles. Pericles has been a four-year project, and it will come up to its end by the end of this year or end of January. Um, within this four-year project, it was like 10 million euros budget of the project. So there is a huge amount of research that has been done, and quite a lot of uh, software and tools and solutions have been developed within the project. And we actually have a workshop this afternoon that we are going to show a few of those solutions, but unfortunately it got full very fast. If a couple of you, one or two or three max, are very, very interested to see the tools, please contact my colleague Eva and uh, maybe we can find room for you. Otherwise, 
we can follow up this uh, later on and there will be another event in London later on where we have, maybe you can see some of these tools there. You can contact us. We also have created a training module, a training package. So some of our colleagues have contributed content and we call it Pericles Modular Training Package. And right now we have nine different modules in production. And what you can do is you can go to the Pericles website and in the middle there is training. By the end of this year, those modules should be completed. You are free to use them, include them in your educational programs or whatever you want to do with them. So each module has got different parts and there will be lectures and readings and other stuff in there if you are interested. So thank you very much for being here. It was really nice seeing so many of you here, even though if it was in English and uh, a little bit uh, not the usual topic of book fair, perhaps. But uh, thank you everyone for being here and accepting our invitation. Very interesting discussion. Thank you, Nazareth.